Hey, this is Charles with Rocky Mountain ATV MC. Today I'm going to show you how to rebuild the top end on your TRX 450R. The top ends on these ATVs needs to be freshened up periodically and some ways to know that your ATV is ready for that is if you're burning oil or if your engine is hard to start due to low compression or like us, we're actually gonna install a big bore kit on this. We wanna get a little more power out of the engine. Now what's nice about these Cylinder Works big bore kits is they bolt right up. You don't have to do any modifications to your crankcase halves. So it's a pretty simple install and this process will be similar for all of the TRX 450Rs, both in the kickstart and electric start models from 2004 to 2014. Now this one right here, this is a 2008 TRX 450ER, meaning the electric start model. So let's go ahead and jump into this. Just keep in mind, you wanna reference your model specific service manual for more information, proper procedures and specs. To do this job, we have some common hand tools, rags, safety glasses, rubber gloves, we also need some precision measuring tools like the feeler gauges, digital caliper. You don't have to have a micrometer and snap gauge or dial bore gauge, but we highly recommend it. And then also we will take a look at the valves. So we have the Tusk valve spring compressor, piston pin puller from Motion Pro, and a cam gear holding tool. You'll also want to have a funnel and a drain pan. If you're reusing your cylinder, you're going to want to use a hone and a nylon brush to clean that out. We're also changing our engine and transmission oils. We're using the Tusk oil filter. And then for coolant, we're using engine ice. We need to clean all of our parts. So we're gonna use some contact cleaner for that. And then we're also using assembly lube. Now, as far as parts go, we're using the Cylinder Works standard big bore complete cylinder kit. This kit comes with the piston kit. You have the gasket set and the brand new cylinder and this piston is actually matched to the cylinder, so you know you have the exact tolerances that you need. And when we're in here, we're also gonna replace the spark plug, our valve cover gasket, and then we are looking at those valves, so we're gonna replace these valve stem seals. We have a couple O-rings. We found these under the OEM diagram. And then depending what your valve clearance is right now, you may or may not need some shims. And if you need any of these parts or special tools, Click the link in the description below. It'll take you to our website where we have everything you need to get this job done. First things first, you wanna start with a clean machine. We have our service manual pulled out and ready to reference. And then what we're gonna do now is drain our engine oil. We're also draining our transmission oil. You don't have to do the transmission, but you do need to drain your coolant. So we'll do that as well. Next, we'll remove our seat. We're gonna service this air filter so it can be drying while we replace the piston. The next steps are to remove the top cover, front fenders, and our gas tank. All right, the next step is to remove this heat guard plate. And in my opinion, this is probably the hardest part of the whole job, just because there's so many wires and things that you need to work this thing around to get it out. So what we're gonna do is first we'll loosen this cable tie for these wires, get that out of the way. And I'm just gonna leave it loose. The next we have a clip right here that holds these wires down. We're gonna pop that up. And then we have three clips that are fastening this thing down. So we're gonna remove those. And this third clip is on the right side of the ATV on that coolant reservoir. The next thing we'll do is remove that throttle cable from that clip. 
I'll try to get that out of the way so you can see this. And right down here, we have a retainer for our idle adjuster. And I'm taking a flat blade screwdriver, turn it sideways, pop that clip open, and we'll pull this out. So now that's out of the way. And then we have our connector on our engine coolant temp sensor. We need to disconnect that. All right, after that, we're gonna disconnect the ground and primary wire from the ignition coil. The next thing we need to do is make sure the plastic is pulled away from these clips. And we actually pulled this away when we removed our gas tank to remove those straps. After that, you can remove the hose and then this wiring harness, all the retainers, you'll wanna move them out of that. At this point, you're just gonna work this tray out and there's two clips over here and that's on both sides, you'll pop those up. The next thing we need to do is clean this area up around the valve cover really well so we don't get any dirt in our engine. So I'm just taking a little contact cleaner and a rag. After that, I'm gonna pull this clamp back and remove this vent tube. We'll remove the spark plug cap. And once that's out of the way, I'm gonna use some compressed air to blow out the spark plug hole. Once that's clean, we'll remove the spark plug. The next couple of steps that we're gonna do is remove the header and the engine hangers. Next, we'll remove the carburetor. To do that, we actually have two electrical wires coming off of it. So we need to loosen up this clamp right here that holds the wires in place. And I'm using a screwdriver to help break those free. Now to get the carburetor off, we'll loosen both hose clamps. On the kickstart models, you're also gonna have to remove a hot start. And then once you have these clamps loosened up, you, you can pull the carburetor back and remove it from the machine. And you either have the option to disconnect your throttle cable or like us, we're just gonna zip tie the carburetor to the handlebars for now. The next step is for us to check our valve clearance. That way we know if we need to use different shims or not when we go back together with the top end. So we're gonna remove the timing covers on both sides of the engine and the valve cover and we'll put the engine on top dead center on the compression stroke. All right, so how you'll know if you're on top dead center on the compression stroke is there's the little window for the flywheel. There's a line with a T next to it that's gonna be lined up with the mark in the flywheel cover. And then also your cam lobes are gonna be facing towards the rear of the machine. And then on the cam sprocket, you have two marks. Those marks should be horizontal and lined up with the two arrows on the cam holder. And when you're checking your valve clearance, you just want a slight drag on the feeler gauge. And we'll check these intakes. So the spec on these is six thousandths of an inch plus or minus one thousandths of an inch. And then on the exhaust, you're 11 thousandths of an inch, plus or minus one thousandths of an inch. And if you need to know how to calculate the new shim to put in there, if your valve clearance is not correct, we do have a video that shows you how to do that. Now, as you go through this process, you wanna write your measurements down, and that way, if one of these is off, you can use that measurement to help select the correct shim and get everything back into spec and all of our valve clearances are actually within spec. Next, we'll remove the cam chain tensioner. Now to do this, I'm gonna loosen this bolt on the back. We need, that, we need to do that for reassembly and then we'll completely remove the tensioner. And don't forget the gasket. All right, the next thing we need to do is remove this cam sprocket. 
Now, on some of the older models, you can use a cam gear holding tool that's going to help you loosen the bolts up. But for this one, what we're going to have to do is hold the crankshaft from rotating, and we're just going to use that bolt on the right side of the engine where we removed that timing plug from. And then we'll use a six millimeter Allen key on the cam sprocket bolt. And the first one, we're just gonna break it loose. Then we're gonna rotate the engine over until we have the other bolt exposed. And then at this point, we're gonna remove this one all the way. Just be really careful not to drop that down into the bottom end. Now we'll rotate the crankshaft clockwise again until that first bolt is exposed, and then we can remove it the rest of the way. And when I take this out, I'm keeping my fingers on the sprocket, and then I'm just gonna slide it off and remove it from the cam chain. At this point, we're done rotating the engine over, so I'm actually gonna let this cam chain drop down into the bottom end, and when we go to get it out, we're just gonna use a magnet to pull it up. Next, we'll remove the cam holder by loosening these four bolts in a crisscross pattern, and we'll pull this out, but keep in mind, you wanna keep track of the shims and buckets on the bottom side, and we'll lay all of the parts out in order. Now on the bottom side of this cam holder, you also have two dowel pins, so keep track of those. And then as you can see, these shims actually stayed in the buckets. Sometimes they can fall out, so just be aware of that. And we'll also wanna pull these two shims on the exhaust side out, and again, lay them out in order. Now on the side of the cylinder head and cylinder, we have three bolts. I'm gonna remove these two top bolts and then just loosen the cylinder one for now. After that, we can remove these cylinder head bolts in a crisscross pattern. And I'll just use a magnet to get these washers out. Once you've done that, you can remove the rag and we're gonna remove the cylinder head. It can be useful to use a soft face mallet to tap on the edges to help bring this up. Just be really careful not to damage the cylinder head. We'll remove this gasket. Looks like we had one dowel pin pull up with the cylinder head and then one dowel pin stayed on the cylinder. So you wanna lo locate both of those. And you'll also need to remove this cam chain guide. Next, we'll remove the hose on the back of the cylinder and that eight millimeter head bolt from the left side. Now with those things out of the way, we can pull the cylinder out. Now just be careful when you pull this out, don't let the piston slap against the engine case. And if this is stuck on there, again, you can use the mallet to break it free. Just be really cautious when you do that. Next thing we're gonna do is stuff some rags below the piston, just so we don't lose the circlip down in there. Then we can use some needle nose pliers and remove this circlip. So at this point you can see if the wrist pin pushes through easily, but most of the time they don't. So you're gonna use a piston pin or wrist pin puller. And again, this is available on our website. This one's from Motion Pro. So what we're gonna do, put the adapter in place. We're gonna wait, make sure we have our threads all the way in. I've already put a little bit of grease on these threads. And then we'll put the correct size collet on the back side. You need the collet to be just a little bit smaller outside diameter than what the wrist pin actually is. And then when you install this, just keep in mind that it's reverse thread. And then we can just use our wrench to pull the wrist pin through. After that, we can remove the piston. Next, we'll remove these rags. And again, we have the dowel pins. You need to keep an eye out for those. And we'll remove this gasket. Next, I'm gonna clean this gasket sealing surface. I'm just gonna use a little bit of contact cleaner, a rag, and a tusk gasket scraper. All right, now that we have our gasket sealing surface cleaned up, we need to inspect this connecting rod. So starting with the small end, we're just gonna do a visual inspection on it. There are measurements in the book that you can take. So if anything looks out of the ordinary on this, you definitely wanna take those measurements. But for us, we're gonna visually inspect it, what we're looking for is any signs of bluing or galling, pitting, or any other damage on the inside diameter of the small end. Ours is actually looking pretty good, so we'll go ahead and check out the big end. So on this connecting rod, you don't want any up or down play. If you have that play, then you're gonna need to replace the crankshaft or get this connecting rod replaced. Now this connecting rod will have some 
rock from side to side. So uh, to check for up and down play, I like to move it to one side. I'll pull up and down on it, see if I can feel any movement. And then we can also check the side play and that's gonna be a good indicator if this connecting rod is worn out. Our side clearance actually measured at 20 thousandths of an inch. The service limit is 30 thousandths of an inch. So as long as you're under that spec, then you should be good to go as long as there is no up and down play. The next step is to clean and inspect our cylinder. Now, as far as the piston goes, we know we're not reusing it. This is the whole reason we're in here is to replace it. So we're not even gonna measure this. You can see on this one, it has quite a bit of wear and it was definitely time for us to get in and replace this. Now we're gonna remove the dowel pins and we're gonna scrape our sealing surfaces. Once we've done that, we're gonna go ahead and clean all the dirt and oil off the cylinder. So towards the top of the cylinder, we have this carbon ring. And if you are gonna hone your cylinder out, then that's gonna help remove all that stuff. But just to get this inspected, I'm actually just gonna use some of this maroon Scotch-Brite and we're gonna clean that out of there. And as we go through the cleaning process, we're gonna try to keep that crosshatch pattern. So we're gonna clean this in both directions at an angle. Now that we have the cylinder cleaned up, we need to inspect the Nicosil coating. Now what the Nicosil coating is, it's just a really thin, hard coating that the piston rings right on. And if that's worn through, then you need to get the cylinder either replated or you're gonna have to replace the cylinder. So to inspect that, most of your wear is gonna be from front to back where that piston skirt rides. So that's where you're gonna see some vertical lines. Now, if they're very faint, and you can run your fingernail across them and your fingernail doesn't catch on any of them, then the cylinder is still okay to use. But if you have some deep scoring in there and you run your fingernail across it and it catches on those scores, then you know you need to replace the cylinder or get it replated. The other thing you can do is actually measure it. And we do recommend doing this. You're gonna check for out of round and for taper. Take measurements in three different spots at the top, middle, and towards the bottom. And then you'll take your Y measurements, top, middle, and bottom, and that's gonna be right in line with where your wrist pin normally goes. Once you've written down all of those measurements, you'll compare them, and that's gonna let you know if you're out of round or if you have too much taper. Now, if you've determined that the cylinder is good, a lot of people will hone these out, and it's really up to you whether or not you're gonna do that. And all that does, it's gonna restore that cross hatch in there and it's also gonna deglaze the cylinder. We do have a video in the link below, so be sure to check that out if that's something you wanna do. Now, if you are gonna reuse your stock cylinder, I do recommend doing the final cleaning in some warm soapy water. You'll use some nylon brushes to clean it out and especially one of these has an oil passageway up through here, so you definitely wanna make sure this thing is really clean before you go back together. But on the other hand, if the cylinder was bad, or if you wanted to go with a big bore kit like us, again, we wanted some more power out of our machine. So we went with the Cylinder Works big bore kit, and it's just a real convenient package. It comes with the piston already matched to the cylinder, so you don't have to do, worry about doing any measurements. And it comes with the gasket sets, the rings, wrist pin, and the circlips. The next step is for us to check the piston ring end gap. Now, most of the time, this is gonna be spot on, but we just wanna double check and make sure we don't need to make any adjustments. So on a stock piston, you're gonna have an R stamped into the stock piston ring for the top one, and then an RN for the second ring. And for this piston kit, it's actually re reversed. The R, there's no way this piston ring can go in the top groove. It can only fit in the second groove. And then it also has this dull finish where that's usually the second ring and then the top ring normally has this more shiny surface or a chrome looking coating on it. So anyway, we're gonna take this top ring, we're gonna install it into our cylinder. Then we're gonna use the piston to square it up. And once it's squared up, we're gonna check that end gap. Now, you're gonna have a minimum of 10 thousandths of an inch for the top ring, which we have, so we know we're good. And then for the second ring, the minimum end gap is 9 thousandths of an inch. Now that's how you do it with a stock piston. The Cylinder Works kits come with these end, end gaps already checked. 
so we know we're good to go. And if you did have to end up adjusting these end gaps, you can take a small file and file them down. Now I do want to point out these cylinder works kits come ready to go right out of the box, but it's still not a bad idea to double check that ring end gap. Now at this point, we're going to get all this stuff ready to install onto the bike. So what we need to do now is we're going to install one of the circlips into this piston before we install the rings. So I'm going to install the circlip on this side and I'm just going to roll it into place using these small needle nose pliers. So next we'll install the oil ring expander or spacer and we're going to make sure that the ends butt up next to each other and they don't overlap. Next we're going to install the oil control rails and make sure that the gaps are offset. The first end gap on the rail was here, so we're going to put this one over here. Once that's in place, you want to check that expander ring again and make sure that the end gap on that is not overlapping itself. So for the other rings, we pretty much need to make a Y. This expander gap is right here. So we need one ring end gap facing there and the other one is gonna be facing about right here. So we'll go ahead and install the second ring. It's critical that the letters on these top two rings face up. And I'm just working that around the piston. You don't wanna overexpand it or break it. Just be really careful when you're putting these on. Next, we can install the top ring. Then once those are in place, we can actually apply some oil to this piston. And we went ahead, we did wash this cylinder off in some soapy water just to be safe, or at the very minimum, I'd spray it down with some contact cleaner just to make sure that no contaminants got in here during shipping or whatever. Make sure it's 100% clean and we'll apply some assembly lube to this as well and install the piston into it. We'll also apply some of this lube inside the wrist pin bosses. And then I do want to point out, you can install this piston onto the connecting rod right now, but what we're going to do just to make things a little bit easier, or at least I find this way easier. I install this into the cylinder first and then slide everything down onto the connecting rod and then slide the wrist pin in place and our last circlip. So to do that, keep in mind which way the piston goes. So this arrow is facing the exhaust side. Another way you can tell is these bigger cutouts are for the intake valves. So make sure you're installing this piston the right way. All right, now to get this piston installed, what we're gonna do is squeeze the piston rings with our hands and there's a little taper at the bottom of the cylinder. That's gonna help us get this installed and compress the rings. And for me, why I like to do this with the cylinder or with the piston off the bike, it's just a little bit easier and you have a little more room to work with it on the bench. And we're gonna keep installing this until the rings are just past the end of the cylinder and we're barely gonna have enough room to install this wrist pin. And we're also gonna remove this exhaust gasket. So now onto the cylinder head, I'm gonna remove this dowel pin and we're gonna clean our sealing surface and the combustion chamber as best as we can. And to do that, you can use a little bit of carbon remover a soft bristle brush and a gasket scraper to help clean those things up. We wanna check and make sure the valve train components are all good to go and that we can get a long life out of this engine. So what we're gonna do, we're definitely gonna be replacing these valve stem seals, but we also wanna check the sealing area of the valves. And the quickest way to do that is just with some solvent. I'm gonna pour that down the ports, make sure it's above the sealing surface on the valve. We'll wait a minute and if you see this stuff, if it, it can either weep or it can pour out one of the two, but it's usually pretty obvious if you have a bad seal. So these ones are looking pretty good 
and we'll go ahead and check the intake valves. So this cylinder head isn't showing any leaks, so we know that these valves are most likely in good condition. They may be cupped out. We still need to look at them and do a visual inspection, but that most likely all this stuff is probably going to be good. We'll just take everything out, make sure everything's clean, and then install some new valve guide seals. Now to take the valves out, I'm going to use the Tusk valve spring compressor. This compressor, it comes with several different sizes of adapters for these valve spring retainers on the top. So you want to make sure you're choosing the right one. This is going to have a little bit wider one for the intake and a little bit more narrow one for the exhaust. So I'll go ahead and clip it onto our tool and then the round end, we're going to stick this into that little pocket on the valve and we'll just compress the spring down a little bit until you have two keepers right here that are next to that retainer, the valve spring retainer. And I have a magnetized screwdriver right here. Once those are exposed, you can use your screwdriver or any other magnet to pull those out. Then we'll just back off the valve spring compressor. And you want to keep everything in order as you take it apart. So we have the retainer, the spring. If you accidentally drop the spring, just keep in mind the tighter coils go towards the valve seat. Even though we did the solvent test and we have a pretty good idea that everything's in good condition, we just want to double check. So this valve, if I try to rock it back and forth, it should just barely, barely have a little bit of play in it. If there's a lot of play in it, you want to go and check out our cylinder head rebuilding video and get everything measured out. So I've pushed it off the valve seat. I try to rock it back and forth and it's barely moving back and forth. So this thing should be good to go. So I'll go ahead and take this valve out. And then for the valve seat, what we're looking for, we wanna make sure there's no pitting in here, or if there's any signs of visible damage, then you know you need to get this repaired. Now on the other side, what I'm gonna do is remove our valve guide seal. Just use some pliers for that. And these valve guides, since we didn't have a ton of play in there, it's probably pretty good. So we just wanna make sure that on this end, there's no cracks. Ours is looking good, so I'm gonna take a magnet and pull the spring seat off. So once you're to this point, now you can do the same steps on the remaining three valves. And if you're gonna reuse these valve keepers, you wanna make sure they stay with the corresponding valve. So now that we have all of our valves removed, before we install the new valve guide, guide seals, what we're gonna do is clean everything off really well. So we're gonna use some contact cleaner. If you wanna get some of the carbon out, especially on that exhaust side, you can use some kind of carbon remover and get that all cleaned up. All right, now we're just gonna do a visual inspection on the valve. Again, there's several different measurements you can take with these valves, but we expect these to be good. So we're just gonna make sure that this valve face isn't pitted. We also wanna check it for cupping. So the face itself, it should be a smooth, straight surface all the way across. If it's dished out, then you know it's worn out and needs to be replaced. And then if anything looks weird on this stem, if it doesn't look uniform or if it looks really worn out in one spot, you're definitely gonna to wanna to measure it. And then on the top, you just wanna make sure that this end is not mushroomed out or damaged in any way. Now to get this cylinder head back together, we're first going to install the spring seat and then you need to install the valve guide seal. They are a different size, so this brown one, it's a larger inside diameter hole. That's going to be for the intake side and then the green one will be for the exhaust side. And when you install these, it's really important to make sure you have an, some assembly lube on them. And we're also just going to put a drop down that valve guide. Then we'll take the spring, again, the tight coils are facing down, spring retainer on top. And you only need to compress this enough to expose that keeper groove. And we'll just use our magnet to put these keepers in place. Once both keepers are in place, we can then remove the valve spring compressor and we'll repeat these same steps on the remaining three valves.
Now that we have all the valves installed, what we're going to do is take a punch on the end of the valve and we're going to tap it with a hammer and that's going to make sure that these keepers are seated all the way. Now before we go back together with everything, we're going to do a quick visual inspection on the cam and our chain slider. You also want to check the one that's in the engine cases still. And on this, you're just checking for any grooves that were caused by your cam chain. If this thing's all grooved out, you're going to want to replace it. Um, this cam gear, if this thing looks like it's been worn really bad from the cam chain, if the teeth are uneven or if there's any obvious damage to it, you're going to want to replace it. And then this cam chain tensioner, I'm going to take this bolt from the back. And all we're looking for here is if I take a flat blade screwdriver and turn this all the way in. If I release this, I want to make sure it pops out just like that all the way on its own. If it doesn't do that, then you know this is bad and needs to be replaced. Now moving on to the camshaft, we're just checking for any obvi obvious signs of damage. So we're going to check these cam lobes and we're going to check for any pitting or galling. And what galling is, it just happens from metal to metal contact and some of the metal transfers from one piece to another. So really if there's damage to this, it should be fairly obvious. And if you had lack of lubrication, this camshaft, it's going to look blue. So look out for those things, any obvious signs of damage. Make sure that these bearings rotate smoothly. And if all of that looks good, then you're good to go. The other thing we need to check with the cam holder is these buckets. You want to make sure they move smoothly inside of their bore and make sure they stay with the same bore that they came out of because all of these parts, again, they wear together. Now, if all those parts look good on your machine, we'll go ahead and start reassembling the top end. Now with the cam chain, I'm just going to fish this up. We're going to briefly inspect it. We just want to make sure that all of the links move freely and none of them bind up. So this chain is looking pretty good. The other thing you can check where the chain rides on the cam sprocket. Make sure that you don't have really sharp edges or any obvious signs of wear or damage and make sure these link pins are in good condition. Next we're going to install our dowel pins and our cylinder base gasket. All right, next step, we're going to apply some assembly lube to the small end of the connecting rod. Now we're ready to install our cylinder with the piston. All right, at this point, we need to line up our wrist pin bosses on the piston with the connecting rod, and then we'll install the wrist pin and slide it through. Once you've done that, you'll install the new circlip. And again, you want the gap either facing the 12 o'clock or the six o'clock position. Once you have that clip in place, it's critical that you make sure it's seated all the way down and the gap is in the correct position. Now, once that's in place, we can remove the rags. You wanted to keep these rags in there just in case that circlip pops out. That way it doesn't go in the bottom end. So once those are removed, we'll lower the cylinder down onto the crankcase halves. All right, the next thing we're gonna do is pull up on the cam chain with our magnet and install our chain guide. Make sure you get it located on the bottom into its groove. Once you've done that, we'll install these dowel pins. And I've got to say, this kit is looking really good. I can't wait to see how it runs. Next, we'll install the head gasket. And before you torque down your cylinder head nuts, you want to install these three bolts on the side and that way everything's all lined up. 
Now we can install the cylinder head nuts and washers. We're going to apply some assembly lube to those and then we'll torque those nuts down to 40 foot pounds in a couple of different steps and we're going to do that in a crisscross pattern. And we'll just tighten these bolts down on the side now. All right, next step, we're going to install our shims and just keep in mind if you needed any different sizes, make sure you put those in now. Now before we put the camshaft in, I'm just going to get our new valve cover gasket glued into place. So we'll remove this old one, we'll clean out all this old glue. Now that we have that old glue removed, we're going to apply some of this Honda rubber adhesive and we're just going to put it in a few different places and that's going to keep our gasket from coming off. And you definitely want to wipe off any that got on the inside of the valve cover. And we'll go ahead and put our new valve cover gasket in place. I'm just going to wipe off any glue that came off inside here. And once you've done that, I'm going to lay this gasket so it faces down and has the weight of the valve cover on it. And that's going to help everything set up. So at this point, we're ready to install our cam holder onto the top of the engine. So to do that, I'm going to put assembly lube right where the buckets ride. Make sure that our dowel pins are in place. And again, make sure the buckets go into their original bores. Now once you've done that, I'm just going to hold my fingers over where those buckets normally go and we'll set the cam holder down into place and make sure that your dowel pins are lined up and the, the cam holder seats all the way down. All right, so now we can apply some oil to these bolts and we're going to torque them in a crisscross pattern to 10 foot-pounds. Next step, we're going to install this breather hose onto the back of the cylinder. So our next step, what we're going to do is clean out the threads on the end of the camshaft where that sprocket bolts on. And the reason we're doing this is we're using Loctites on the bolts. And for the Loctite to set up right, the threads need to be clean and free of any oil. Next, I'm going to clean the sprocket off and the sprocket bolts. Now that we're cleaned up, we're ready to reinstall the cam sprocket. But I do want to point out that, again, we need to make sure the timing marks still lined up on the flywheel. Once you've verified that, the timing marks you'll use for this cam sprocket are this triangle right here on the cam holder. And 180 degrees across from that, there's another arrow. And it's kind of hard to see. It's right behind this frame. What we'll do is take our cam sprocket. And there's actually two little lines right here. Those two lines will center up with the tip of the arrows that are on the cam holder. And while you're installing this, don't forget, this is your part of your auto decompressor and that tab coming out of the camshaft needs to be lined up in the center of this. And I'm gonna put the sprocket pretty close to where it actually needs to be. So our cam sprocket actually lined up perfectly with our timing marks. Our flywheel is still in the correct position, but if it didn't, you can just keep moving it on the cam chain until the marks line up perfectly. Then we'll install the two bolts. We'll torque them to 14 foot-pounds. We'll also apply a little bit of medium strength thread lock to these bolts. And again, we're going to start by installing one bolt, rotate the crankshaft one revolution, install the second bolt, torque it down, go one more revolution of the engine, then torque that second bolt. Next, we'll clean up our sealing surface, pour our gasket on the cam chain tensioner using contact cleaner and a rag. And keep in mind, when you install it like this, what you're gonna have to do is keep the tensioner all the way wound up with the screwdriver and it's very important to make sure that it's wound all the way in during installation. If it's not, then you can actually damage your cam chain because if this is out and then you try to push it in further, it's going to press too hard on the cam chain. So now I'm going to take my first gasket, followed by the spacer, second gasket, and then at this point I'm actually going to stick the bolts through it. We'll set all of this in place and I'm actually going to start these bolts a couple of threads without 
forcing them into place. As long as you're doing this by hand, you should be okay. Get these bolts started, and that way everything's lined up and there's less pieces to hold. So now that we're lined up, before we put those bolts in any further, what we need to do is, again, stick the screwdriver in, wind up the tensioner, take all the tension away, and then we can tighten down our bolts. You can see when we have that wound up, I can actually press the tensioner into place by hand. That's gonna make it easier to get these bolts tightened up. All right, now I can release the tension. And after that, we'll install the bolt on the back of the tensioner and make sure that we have that ceiling washer in place. Now at this point, we're gonna turn the engine over clockwise two turns from that right side of the bike and make sure nothing's binding up. We'll verify that all of our timing marks are on. And just before we install that valve cover, I just wanna apply some assembly lube to the cam, the rocker arm, and also those bearings. Next, we'll install our timing plug covers and our spark plug. The next step is to install our intake boot and the carburetor. You'll notice I just started by pressing back on that air boot and it pops right into place. Just make sure that all the boots are all the way on and the carburetor is fully seated. And make sure the tabs on that front boot are all lined up and then we can go ahead and tighten down the clamps. After that, we can connect the wires that are coming from the carb back into their locations on the harness. We'll just make sure those wires are routed and clamped down correctly. After that, we can install the breather hose onto the valve cover. All right, now we need to install the hangers on both sides. So to do that, we're gonna torque these upper bolts to 20 foot pounds on 04, 05s, and then 26 pounds on 2006 and newer. And then for the big bolt that goes all the way through, that's gonna be 40 foot pounds. Next, we'll install both of the cooling hoses that we removed previously and tighten down the clamps. After that, we can install the exhaust flange gasket. I put a little bit of grease on this to help hold it in place while we install the header. And it's not a bad idea to use some anti-seize on these studs. We'll go ahead and install these bolts. We'll tighten them down and then we'll tighten our exhaust clamp. Next up is my favorite part of the whole build. We need to install this heat guard. So I'm just gonna start by putting the front end over here. We'll get our throttle cable routed and then we can rock the front end around and press it down into place. And when you do this, really you just have to work one wire at a time and don't force it. Now we can install our three trim clips and route all the cables and wires exactly how they were before. Don't forget to attach the ground wire on your ignition coil or the engine coolant temp sensor. The next steps are to install our gas tank, our front fenders, and that front cover. All right, next thing, we'll install our air filter. And our old air filter, we actually had a tear in it, so we got a new one. We sell both OEM and aftermarket air filters. So if you need that, or if you need any engine parts, we have a lot of different options available on our website. So be sure to check that out. Now, once we've done that, we can install the air box lid and then our seat. At this point, we can fill up our coolant. We're just using some engine ice. And you also wanna make sure your cooling reservoir is topped off as well. 
For the transmission fluid, we're going to pour 550 milliliters for the 04 and 05 models, and then 680 milliliters for the 06 and newer models. Now for the oil on the engine side, if you change your oil filter, it will pour 820 milliliters for the 04 and 05 models, and then for the 06 and newer models, we'll pour 690 milliliters. And just keep in mind, we have the top end apart, so we might need to add a little bit more oil. So you definitely want to verify your level in, with the sight glass. So the next step is to bleed our cooling system. If you notice, we didn't install our radiator cap yet. So what we're going to do is start this up. We're going to let it idle two to three minutes. We'll snap the throttle a couple of times. That's going to help any air bubbles come to the top and let that thermostat open up. And once you've done that, we'll install the radiator cap. We'll leave it running for another minute. And then we're going to let the engine cool completely. And once the engine is completely cool, then you can double check all your fluids and make sure they're all topped up. That's all there is to replacing the top end on your TRX450R. If you need any parts like the Cylinder Works Big Bore Kit or anything else for your ATV, be sure to check out our website. We have a lot of different options on there and we offer free shipping on orders over $75. Now, if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos like this. Thanks for watching.